viruses first, but uh, today's lecture we're going to go over uh, viruses and bacteria. We're going to go over the key components of it. A lot of this is stuff that you guys are already going over, so uh, the lecture will help reinforce some of the, the basics that you guys are talking about right now. Uh, firstly, viruses have three main parts. Uh, viruses are either going to have the nucleic acid, DNA or RNA. They have a covering or a capsid, which is made of protein. Some viruses have uh, outer coverings that are made of lipids. Okay, lipids are fats, as we've learned previously. And they are very specific in what they infect. Okay, viruses infect plants, animals, and bacteria, and they are very specific, which we're going to learn in the uh, slides to follow. Okay, uh, we have a couple of things going on here. We have T4 bacteriophage. On the top is what an artist depicts, and on the bottom there is an actual picture that is a uh, microscope picture blown up hundreds to thousands of times. We have tobacco mosaic virus and, and the flu virus. These are all viruses that we know a lot about, and scientists know a lot about these viruses. A couple different ways that virus, viruses affect. There's a lytic cycle, which is active, so this happens immediately. Uh, the virus attaches itself to a host cell, it injects its nucleic acid and information and then what happens is that the cell interprets that nucleic acid as its own and it makes the viruses then the cell explodes and the viruses are spread throughout the body again this happens immediately all right so this is the cycle that is slower to process in the cell it is latent means that it's slow it's the lysogenic now the cycle can go from lytic to lysogenic and what happens is that it's a dormant phase so kind of like a resting type of phase whereby the virus doesn't do its dirty work right away what it does is that it causes its cell host to duplicate one cell making many cells and each time it duplicates it has a copy of the virus's DNA inside and what causes it to wake up and spread? Well, any kind of environmental condition that is favorable. So an example of this is whenever we get a cold sore. Okay, the virus is already present in our system and it doesn't express itself until uh, the conditions are right for that particular virus to, to uh, display itself in the form of a cold sore. I mentioned before that viruses are very specific. Okay, to illustrate that, for example, bats and otters both carry the rabies virus, but neither are affected by it. They just are a host. Okay. Um, so they, they have it, they carry it, but they don't get sick, just like other carriers that exist in other things in our lives. Uh, they are also very cell specific, meaning that, for example, HIV will only infect immune system cells like T cells. Flu only infects respiratory cells in the respiratory tract, and chicken pox will only infect nerve ending cells. They won't affect any other kind of cell. That's where they are specified to infect. All right, so here are some diseases that are caused by viruses. Now, some of these uh, we're doing research on right now. We have chicken pox, hepatitis, common cold, influenza. Now, common cold is different from the flu, okay? Measles, polio, rabies, hemorrhagic fever. There was a movie years ago called Outbreak where that disease was present. Avian flu, Ebola, swine flu, these are all viruses that affect uh, different things here on our planet. A few different ways that we treat viruses. The main way is vaccines, and a vaccine is a non-harmful form of the virus. It is weakened. It is dead in some instances, and it causes an immune response. Now, people do get sick from that immune response, but you generally aren't getting uh, sick from the virus that was weakened. Uh, the other thing that 
happens as well is that we can use antiviral drugs. For example, there are people who right now living with HIV because they are taking uh, HIV antiviral drugs that help prevent the virus from expressing itself. And as long as you take these drugs, then you have a better chance of surviving an extensive amount of time. Problem is, is that the, the drugs are very expensive. So we have two different kingdoms of bacteria uh, that we went over previously. Um, bacteria, as we know, are prokaryotes, meaning that they're single-celled. They don't have membrane-bound organelles. You bacteria kingdom are the ones that we kind of interact with on a daily basis in our environment, in our ecosystem. They're on our desks, they're on our skin. Um, they are in our intestines in the form of E. coli. Their cell walls are made up of a different substance called petitoglycan, and it is different from the substance that makes up the cell walls of the archaeobacteria. So if we were to ever do a compare and contrast, that would be one of the things that we could list as a difference. Archaeobacteria are ancient bacteria. They've been on the planet for billions of years. They're believed to be some of the first organisms that were present on the planet. They live in extremely harsh conditions. Examples are methanogens, halophiles, thermophiles. These things you find at the bottom of volcanic vents, the bottom of oceans, uh, geysers, etc. So the one on the left, we can't really tell visually unless we were uh, a bacteriologist that uh, these two are separate and different types of bacteria, but they are different. Eubacteria comes in many different shapes. They are differentiated by their structures, whether they're motile or not and whether they can take in food and break that food down into a usable form of energy, i.e. metabolism. Three main shapes are round or cocci, corkscrew, spirilla, hot dog shape or rod shaped bacilli. Okay, and the diagrams there give us uh, examples of the various shapes that the eubacteria group can fall under. All right, some basic bacteria parts that are illustrated with the diagram there. Cell wall, like plants and fungi, cell membrane. Like us, they have DNA. However, that DNA is not housed in a nucleus like ours is. They don't have membrane-bound organelles, but they do have ribosomes like we do, and the <coughs> ribosomes do make proteins in them. They do have structures that help them move. Certain ones do, which are flagella, and the pili, which they use to help them connect with other bacteria uh, via conjugation or IE, which some people term as bacteria sex. Okay, so here there mentions three different ways that the bacteria can copy themselves, grow, or reproduce. Binary fission, we've gone over this before in previous chapters. They just make identical copies of themselves and it takes uh, you know, up to 20 minutes in some bacteria so they can reproduce hundreds to thousands of times, depending on how many bacteria are present. Conjugation is where two bacteria can combine and they can exchange genetic information. Again, that is kind of like bacteria sex. Uh, spore formation. Spores can last on a surface or in dirt, depending on what kind of spores. It can be months, it can be years, it can be decades, hundreds of years. I think I just read something how uh, there were, they found some kind of, I can't remember what type of pathogen, whether it was a bacteria or a virus, they found it frozen in permafrost and because of environmental changes and conditions, it is believed that's, that because of the whatever that infected organism was, if it thaws out and if many of these organisms thaw out, it can still, that those spores and those things that cause bacteria can come back into the environment and cause disease uh, for animals and things in that area. All right, so here's a picture of binary fission. We see our uh, features, cell wall, DNA. We also see that the bacteria simply divides itself and bacteria can keep on doing this. <coughs> Here is a picture of conjugation where the two bacterium are exchanging genetic information, kind of similar to what happens when 
uh, animals have sex. Bacteria play a very essential role in our lives and in our ecosystem. They serve as decomposers, which means that they uh, break down dead things and provide those dead things back into the cycle of life. They are very essential in doing that. They also serve as nitrogen fixating creatures, whereby they take in the nitrogen in the atmosphere, then other bacteria convert that nitrogen to a usable form. Why is that important? Because it's important for soil and for nutrition in the soil for this process to be taken care of, because certain plants are unable to extract the nitrogen that they need, so they need other plants like these ones that have a symbiotic relationship with certain fungi on the roots of their plants to break down. So legumes such as soybean, uh, farmers what they'll do is they have crop rotation. So one year or every couple of years they might plant soybeans that help break down and put nitrogen back into the soil and then in another year they might plant a crop such as corn. Okay. E. coli is found in our intestines. It helps us make vitamins from the food that we eat. We also enjoy food products such as yogurt that are produced from bacteria cultures. And then currently they are using bacterium to study genetic engineering practices to create medicines, etc. Okay, when we're discussing prevention and treatment, there are several things that we can discuss, including certain bacteria actually can be prevented using back, uh, vaccines, such as tetanus and diphtheria. Generally speaking, a vaccine is used for viruses only, but in these two instances, you can use a vaccine to help eradicate them. You also have antibiotics like penicillin. Many of us are allergic to penicillin, however, and then now there are bacteriums such as MRSA that are becoming resistant to it. We also have Lysol and other disinfectants that we clean surfaces with, uh, and we even, you know, uh, also have mouthwash that has some disinfectant properties in them as well. Antibacteria soaps and lotions and things of that nature. We also can kill bacteria with sterilization. So a lot of times our doctors, our surgeons, our dentists will use sterilization to make sure that their tools are not infected with bacteria and other pathogens. Uh, the milk that we consume, if you drink milk, has been pasteurized. You can see the label on the milk bottle. It's been pasteurized, which helps kill uh, and get rid of bacteria that would naturally be occurring in that milk. And then food storage, keeping things cold. That helps delay. It doesn't prevent a lot of times, but it will help delay certain bacteria from um, multiplying in our food products.